So once again, I would like to invite the chair of panel discussion, as well as panelists to be on the stage and a topic of STEM and environmental education and inclusiveness through effective mentorship. And our guest speaker will have one hour and 30 minutes for the whole discussion, including question and answer. So now I would like to give this floor to our guest speaker. Please welcome. Okay, there we go. <laughs> now if you can hear us. Uh, we, we want to start out by introducing ourselves. Um, I'm Deborah Axel, uh, and I'm here uh, with particular interest in this topic, both because of my own professional background as a student advisor for quite a few years at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And also we're now here as co-directors of the Amir Axel Foundation. Uh, with absolutely a, a particular interest in, in education in Cambodia. Um, and I'm Miriam Axel. It's a pleasure to be here. We were in Cambodia about a year and a half ago in 2019, and we absolutely loved having our time there. We're looking forward to being able to come back um, in, in, in better times. But for now, it's, it's fantastic to, to be here with you. We're wishing you a very good morning, a very good evening here in France. It's two in the morning. So wherever you are, we're, we're wishing you a good morning and afternoon. Um, I'm now a, a postdoctoral scholar at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley at the Center for Environmental um, Energy and Environmental Policy. And I recently finished my PhD and I'm remaining a visiting researcher at the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to have a wonderful panel with us today and we're excited to have uh, you all as our, as our audience today. Uh Yes, and we'd, we'd like to start by uh, briefly introducing our panel panelists and then asking them uh, to give a little bit about their own their own background uh, before we start uh, asking our questions. So first, a really big thank you to the organizers. We're honored to be here. And again, we, we look forward to hopefully being able to, to see you in person in the future, but we appreciate the opportunity to be able to host this panel now. Um, for today, we have Professor Moran Cerf, we have Professor Michal Morbarak, um, we have Mr. Samkan Kun with us, and uh, Dr. Una McCarthy Fakhi, and Dr. Lauren Robertson joining us on our panel. And could we ask um, each of you to just tell us a bit uh, about your, your own background and, and, uh, and your interest in mentorship? Uh, so first, we'd like to ask uh, Professor Michal Morbarak, please. Uh, maybe, well, yeah, now we're designing um, Dr. Michael Mosparat to the co-host, so that's why, so, so that he could um, unmute herself. Thank you. Dr. Morbarak, you may be able to find it on the bottom left-hand side. It's the, yeah. In the meantime, if that's all right, maybe I'll ask uh, Professor Cerf to start with introducing himself and his, his background briefly. Sure, do you hear me well? Yes, very well, Perfect. thank you. Okay, so I'm a professor of neuroscience and business. Um, I spend my time between business school where I teach MBA students and companies how to apply neuroscience in the context of how they make decisions. And I spend the rest of the time trying to understand the brain and how we can make the most of it. And in the context of this uh, evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever you are, I, of course, uh, have a lot of students that I mentor um, formally, 
And I guess uh, being a professor means that you're also yourself a mentee of someone else constantly. And uh, you interact with this kind of dynamics often of uh, how to give advice, how to help people improve themselves, how to uh, answer questions that are tough and something that I think will come up today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and I'll move to Dr. Michal Morbach. Are you, are you able to, are you unmuted? Yes. yes. Thank you for releasing my <laughs> mic. <laughs> it was from the uh, host. Yeah. I'm very pleased to be here. I wish I could be there in person, uh, but maybe next year when things uh, become better around the world. Uh, my name is Michal Morbarak, and I'm a professor at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I have a joint appointment in the School of Social Work and the Business School, and my research cuts across the two areas, focusing a lot on diversity management from a global perspective. And in that context, I'm interested in mentorship, especially across different identity groups. And my research has dealt with how mentors can help mentees who do not necessarily belong to their identity group. And I'll be happy to talk about it more as the discussion continues. Thank you. Um, can we now have Dr. Robertson introduce herself, please? Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Lauren Robertson. Such a pleasure to be here with all of you. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear, yes. Excellent. So um, I finished my PhD at uh, Harvard School of Public Health in May 2018. And quite frankly, it was 100% because of mentorship that allowed me to get there and allowed me to finish and, and make a transition ultimately to industry. I was a political science uh, major and a Spanish minor and pre-med and undergrad, came from a family where my mother didn't go to college and was really from a family of um, modeling, acting, advertising and sales and business. So nothing related to the sciences at all, except for sort of a, a tiger mother, father dynamic of wanting me to only be a doctor, a medical doctor. So it was definitely due to mentoring that I have ended up um, where I am now. And uh, that's really, just to be honest, that's really what I enjoy most is peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and mentoring across industries, particularly for women and people of color. So I'm really excited to be here and to um, hear really the discussion and be a part of that and hopefully serve as an ongoing resource if I can be whether that's in the form of um, sponsorship, mentorship, or connecting others to um, people who are more informed than I am. Thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, and, and now can we ask uh, Mr. Kun to introduce himself, please? Hello, hello, Jiripsum, Jiripsu. Hello, uh, good evening from uh, Low, Massachusetts, the eastern corner of uh, Massachusetts here. Uh, but Low is, uh, again, is um, uh, just for your information, is the first planned industrial city of America. So, you know, talking about the topic this, uh, this, uh, this afternoon or the morning in Cambodia, it is a topic. Um, I am some Khan Kerns. I, am, uh, I was born and raised in Cambodia before the war. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, okay. <laughs> and of course, you know, uh, just like uh, many Cambodian Americans here, uh, you know, uh, my, you know, so why the killing field of Cambodia uh, for that, you know, four years and then prior to the and then after that, end up in a refugee camp for another four years before coming to America on November 5th, 1984. And, you know, by then uh, the school years already start. Uh, and after 20 years old, uh, who had no formal education due to the Killing field in Cambodia from 1975, and until I start, you know, college, the uh, formal college, the uh, formal education here, again in uh, the spring of 1985. So you can imagine that those four years with the Khmer Rouge and the four year in the refugee camp. Uh, but I believe in education, and um, and uh, later on become the first uh, person in the family who graduated from college um, uh, in engineering, in electrical and computer engineering. 
and then went to work uh, for a short period of time. But the calling, uh, you know, uh, there's a calling that I need uh, to do something uh, bigger and better, and that is to start working for the community. Since majority of uh, my fellow uh, Cambodian refugee are here uh, with uh, not much uh, support, and then being uh, educated here in America and a survivor from uh, from Cambodia from the killing field and all that, I felt that I'm a, a I, I I can play a better bridge, uh, bridging you know the um, community member to the uh, to American culture to American society here, you know as I have done so for myself and also my, my family. My family of nine, believe it or not, uh, with uh, seven brother and sister, myself is the second uh, child, but the oldest son in the family. And two additional cousins whose parents, you know, um, you know, get killed, uh, parents get killed in the Khmer Rouge. So we adapt them and we brought them here to the US as well. And then the rest of the history, it pretty much uh, working and trying to reestablish new life here in America. Uh, currently I work as a, um, educational advisor for a trio educational uh, educational talent search with a community college. Uh, it's Middlesex Community College here. You know, we I start my um, formal education in America, uh, uh, you know, with the community college and I end up working for a community college. Um, but we have a partnership um, program with uh, the low public school and uh, low public, uh, low, uh, like low well is, uh, as you all know, or may have known, is home to the second largest of Cambodian American in the country. The second one with, um, you know, um, after Long Beach, California. So there's a lot of uh, need, there's a lot of um, work, there's a lot of uh, things to be done, particularly regarding to promoting education in general, but in particular in STEM and being educated uh, in engineering myself. So I put that into good use. And, um, and, and again, I can see it a little on. Uh, I'm married with uh, four, you know, children with my wife, who's a fellow um, refugee from uh, from the from the killing field as well. Uh, we end up meeting each other here after ten years apart, um, and and we have beautiful, you know, children together. And then uh, we work here in law, live in law, work in law. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, it's an honor to have you here with us. Um, and now can we ask Dr. McCarthy Vakri to, to introduce herself, please? Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Una McCarthy Vakri. I am so delighted to join this session. Thank you so much for inviting me. I feel quite honored to be part of this panel. I am coming, calling in from Cambodia. So, um, uh, I am a, di a director of a local NGO here called STEM Education Organization for Cambodia. And we have um, two of our main activities each year. One of them is STEM Sisters Cambodia, which we founded maybe two years ago now. We've run through two cycles of it. It is at its heart a mentoring program. Um, it's a very special program that connects professional women working in STEM fields, who we call our pro-sisters, to university students studying STEM girls. They are our big sisters. And then we have high school girls who are our little sisters. And we have them all connected within a mentoring program. So maybe later on we can get into more detail of that. But um, that is uh, my experience. Um, and my input today will be from a perspective of and creating and managing a mentoring program on the ground in Cambodia. And then our other, one of our other main activities is uh, the annual Cambodia STEM Festival. Um, that last year we um, committed uh, very determinedly to deliver it as Cambodia's first green STEM festival. So we have um, uh, environmental education component there. We ran environmental education throughout the whole festival. Um, we estimate that we saved 58,000 pieces of single use um, plastic from being used over two days. So um, in terms of the topic today, we can touch on environmental education and mentoring within a developing country, Cambodia. So um, thank you very much. I myself, my personal background, I am a chemist. So my background is pure science, um, but I am a passionate educator. And throughout my career, I have worked in many different fields, but um, throughout 
I've had a huge interest and passion for education. So um, yeah, that's me. Thank you so much for including me and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and to all of our, wow, nearly 200 participants. I think it's quite amazing to be able to have people from Cambodia, from the United States, from really across the globe. And it's exciting to have such a wide and diverse spread of participants. We really thank you for being here and thank you. Thank you to our panelists and to the organizers for, for your participation and your time. Um, I think we'd like to just jump into to questions and answers if, if that's all right with our panel. So I think we'll start with a question of um, what does mentorship mean to you and, and wh what's the importance both personally and professionally? How has, how has the role of mentorship helped you uh, advance in your career and how has it helped you help others? Um, and I think if it's all right, we'll, we'll continue with the same order that we started with, uh, beginning with Professor Surf. So I would say that uh, like everyone, I can you know, name at least one mentor for every important event in my life. And I think that uh, this is an indication that uh, you remember kind of the, those people who inspired you and you know, paved the road for you. Um, I, I think that the kind of uh, thoughts that came to mind when I thought about like the mentors that I had in my life and what I took from them is that you can have mentors in a classical way, someone who you define as a mentor, they define you as a mentee and you kind of go on the journey together. That's one type, the classical type, the easy one. There are also mentors that don't know they're your mentors or that uh, don't kind of formally uh, take on the role. And I think that uh, I had a few of those and I, I, you know, at some point I might tell them that they're the inspiration or, uh, but in many ways their mentorship was uh, either in the form of like mentoring someone else that I kind of, took on and learned from and kind of piggybacked and so on. There's also in a kind of niche type, but the negative ones. Sometimes you have negative role models uh, that become in a way your mentors because you kind of ask what was the mistake you made or how did you uh, kind of, what would you have, what would you do now if you have to do it again and how would you fix that? I think that uh, they're kind of, in terms of what the audience wants to know, and I'll, I'll leave it for the other panelists, and unless you want to ask me afterwards, uh, there's, I think, two different kind of things that the listeners should think about, which is if they're mentors, how to navigate that, and if they're mentees. I think that the, the job of the person who is being mentored is also important something thing to note because you navigate things in many ways and you do, do, determine how the mentorship is going gonna, is gonna, to uh, go. The two things I'm going to end with in one sentence each is that one thing that uh, is important in a relationship is also to know how to end it and when to stop it and kind of how to not be totally kind of a, you know, a person that continuously is under someone else's uh, advice, but also at some point says, okay, I now want to for a second take ownership. And I guess the second one, that's the last sentence, is that uh, the take on advice that if, if, if everything is connected right now and I want someone to take from this session together is that when you ask for advice, you're not weak. It's a strong thing to ask for advice. People love giving advice and the mentors are gonna appreciate you for choosing them as someone to give advice. This is kind of something that people sometimes think, okay, well, I don't want to ask for advice. It's going to burden someone else. So I wouldn't uh, uh, kind of feel comfortable. I think that's the, the first and the most important thing I wanted to kind of have everyone leave this uh, kind of gathering from that it's good to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, both uh, the idea of mentors is not necessarily being somebody that you that you you choose not necessarily being a conscious decision to be mentored or you know to to, to choose a mentee um but rather kind of coming about in in you know in, in sort of different ways i think it really kind of resonates with me and especially i think um if i can if i can move the question on to uh professor Morbarak, who if i can you know if i can give a little bit of a, a personal aside is my cousin and growing up um i i sort of you know my father always talked about michal as as being this wonderful model and i think that um this this idea of, of mentorship is coming from from all kinds of different places uh, really resonates with me because 
I think of I think of you, Michal, as a as a mentor, and and I always have from from you know being all of two years old. So it means a lot to to be here and have this conversation to kind of to talk about this. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, that was lovely. Thank you so much, Miriam. And uh, you actually take me to my first point that is very personal, but also general. I think that mentoring is a two-way street. And so every mentor needs to know and be open to learning from their mentee. And it's both a responsibility and the pleasure of uh, being a mentor. And uh, I would connect that to my experience as a mentee during my uh, course of studies, especially the PhD, when um, my research went more into the business direction, business management, and all my mentors were men who did not share my experiences as an immigrant to the United States. And those who took the time to get to know me were much better mentors than those who did not. And I'm hoping that we'll devote some time to that aspect of mentorship that um, I've, I've experienced personally and inspired me in my relationships with uh, mentees, that you have to understand that it goes both ways and that it's a mutual uh, journey that you take together with your mentee and you both grow and change. The assumption of many mentors, erroneously so, is that all the wisdom is, is uh, entrusted to them and the mentee is just there to soak it. And that's a wrong assumption. Um, as we continue in the discussion, I can give some examples from my own experience. But I think that the key to success is understanding that very fundamental issue that uh, it's a two-way street and that's a journey that you take together with your mentee. Uh, I would like to follow up a little bit with what um, Professor Morbarak uh, just said. I think it's a really interesting point that uh, the background and, and common experience matters tremendously in mentorship. And I, I'd, like to, um, I, I'd like to ask um, Mr. Kuhn uh, to talk about his experience with the community in Lowell, Massachusetts that I know has many, um, many young people who are children of, of refugees from Cambodia and how, uh, how he uses that experience in, in mentoring this, this particular group of young people. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Um, well, uh, that's a really, really great you know, question. Um, I have not thought about it, about being the mentor, but again, that is something that is new that I recently you know, adopted. Um, I used to think that you know, we'll do whatever it takes you know, to, um, you know, to, uh, to, to help people. Uh, you know, um, of course, being uh, being an older brother in a family of uh, of uh, nine, you know, you do whatever it takes to help yourself, to help your younger brother and sister to achieve the education without even thinking, you know, am I doing the mentoring? What am I? What I'm doing? I'm leading by the example. So if I really want my brother and sister to really finish the college, you know, I need to do it first. So so that's 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 what you know that's what. Um, that's what the old old way of thinking. That's what I'm doing, and the same thing with um with the um community here. And as you can see, that you know the uh, lowest is home to the second largest of so Cambodian American, you know, population country. But you know, our program serve not only just Cambodian, pretty much everyone else who are you know from uh, first generation. You know, um, uh, meaning that you know if their parent uh, do not have any um, four year college degree, whether they're born here, whether they, you know, um, you know. Uh, then, then we qualify for the program. So in a sense, you know, um, it's really about uh, doing what it takes, you know, to, you know, to do that. And 
um, and I know that you know this job is 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 a is a is is, is a great job. It's um it, it's huge. you. You cannot do it alone. Uh, you know every year we serve about you know over seven you know students from you know uh, sixth grade all the way to twelfth grade, and then go on to college and u- university. And of course, not all of these are all in STEM. So what we do is that you know our our that we emphasize we really integrate it in on a daily basis, on a, on a, on a yearly basis, semester basis. It's really to emphasize about helping, you know, youth, about helping the student per grade, all, you know, different grade, about emphasize about, you know, um, you know um, working on their, improve their math skill, improve their science skill. And particularly, you know, for, for women, for, for young, for younger girls who uh, do not have um, a role model at home, do not have, you know, a um, mentor, you know, at home. So they have a hard time, uh, let, I mean, let alone thinking about engineering. So one of the way that uh, we do, is really to reach out, you know, across the uh, across the uh, educational institution here in in a local area, and then ask them to be mentored, you know, for our, you know for for our, for our student. So, say for example, um, we have um, a uh, program with um, uh, UMass, you know, Law, um, uh, the engineering student, you know, um, both the uh, undergraduate and the graduate you know, engineering student, to you know work with our you know um, our you know our student. Um, and to, you know, sort of not only just, you know, um, but to, to, to formalize some sort of relationship to get to know each other, to really work together, to really encourage that these are the kind of thing that is, uh, that is being done at a college. And they too, you know, as, as a mentee or as a, as a younger student, that they can too can picture themselves to be in that environment, to be working that, to be in working environment, to actually pursue their college degree, despite the fact that, you know, they may come from a social, a low socioeconomical background, uh, and that they too can you know can you know can uh, can, can work on this and of course there's a diversity within the, the university itself that have you know um you know um girl or or, or female from different background including people of their own background as well as other as well so it, in a way um it's really the underlining is that you know um that really to 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 encourage you to support them and so that you know yes you can be like that Yes, you can pursue your um, engineering degree. Yes, you can do any other degree, any other major that you can be done. And on a on a on 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 a semester basis, we really emphasize. So we run uh, additional program to support you know youth you know to become more successful. Despite the fact that you know English may not be you know uh, of course English is their second language and so forth. So we want to make sure that they you know they have the support built in after school, you know, um, program, you know, um, homework program, uh, even, you know, um, we even help with, you know, the math, you know, program as well, so that they can pass the standardized test, which is, you know, the MCAS, it stands for Massachusetts um, Comprehensive Assessment Test. For every student to be able to, you know, graduate with a, with a high school diploma, they need to pass, you know, this, you know, this, uh, this MCAS. And it's including math, science, and also, you know, language art as well. We, you know, um, our program, you know, work on two out of three, which is, you know, the math and the science. So we hire, you know, um, um, a licensed teacher to help teach per grade, whether it's sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and all the way to 10th grade, I mean, 12th grade, sorry. And it's make sure that they have additional support to make sure they'll be able to, you know, to pass these tests. But at the same time, also, you know, um, have a lot of different programs to uh, have the, the college field trip, you know, college tour. Uh, make you know, um, make them feel that you know it's really comfortable that they too can achieve this. You know, so in a way, it's it's sort of the underlines, like you know, and then of course on the on and knowing what 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 college you know require you know, for them to be successful, they know ahead. They started since sixth grade, so per every grade, you know, keep on emphasizing, emphasizing, keep on encouraging, encouraging, and then you know, when twelfth grade, of course, you know, they will we also help them, you know, with a college, you know, application, college research, essay writings, and and financial aid, you know, applications and scholarship applications and so forth and so forth, you know. So we really work along the way, you know, with them. All right. So so that's that's something that I find it to be really really um helpful, uh, not only just the theory, but also the act, the application, the actuality that they work with uh, with uh, with with college students with. Um, uh, so we have the high school then help mentoring the, uh, the 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 middle school you know student and then the college student mentoring the um, you know the, the 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 high school student and on and on and on and on and um, and and that is um, and that is a, uh, a unique um, situation where um, we feel it's really really um, uh, successful because we felt that you know um, it, the younger one the younger mentee or the younger mentor 
who um, just a little bit older than, than, than the mentee can have a, a greater positive, can have a greater impact. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh yeah, you are an old man, you know, you know what you're talking about, you know, you, you've been doing that, you know, it's, it's your career. That's what you do, that's what you get paid to do the job, right? So you can have all of the theory in the world. But when, 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 uh, when we match them up with the, with the younger mentor, right, with a college student, with a high school student, and you know, um, who are good in math and science and so forth and so forth, we feel that it's, it's, it's more productive. We feel that it's more, it, they make a greater, greater impact. And not only that, they form a relationship where mm -hmm. they can, you know, go, I mean, where they can get a support in addition to just the, the regular meeting after, after school or, you know, or, you know, they can form a longer relationship. And therefore, you know, um, ultimately help them to achieve, uh, you know, the college education that, 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 that they want and that their parents want and that we all want. So that's the ultimate, ultimate goal. So I find it to be really, really, uh, and for me, it's a pleasure seeing that because it's, um, to me, it's, uh, it's like a sweet revenge, right? You know, um, after yeah. what the Khmer have done, you know, to me for, uh, so I feel that, you know, this is, this is the, it, it's, it's not, it's not a job, but it's a, it, it's something that, you know, that it's a reward. Every year you see hand and hand and go on to college, whether they start with a two year college first, or they go directly to a four-year college, or they go to Harvard, or they go to MIT. We have a few students actually go actually doing that. It just, it just, it just, a, it just a, a big reward. It just amazing. Just like what I did when I first yeah. came, you know, with proper English, and just go directly to a four year, to a two-year college, and I get a lot of support from there as well. So I felt that you know this is this is a giving back. This is what America have given to me. And it's my duty, it's my responsibility to give it back. And without even, mentor, without even thinking about, oh, am I a mentor or mentor? But I learned a lot from, from, from the younger kid as well, from the material as well, because mm -hmm. every day uh, they come up with different, you know, questions and, and, and challenge. So um, in a way, um, it, it's a both way, you know, a learning process. And I find that to be rewarding, most rewarding uh, profession after all, yeah. So thank you for letting me see it. Well, thank you. No, I think, I mean, you've touched on so many incredibly important topics and ideas. I mean, both this notion of peer mentorship and the fact that mentorship doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, in a hierarchical structure and, um, and this idea of students helping students, um, as well as this kind of idea of, of daring to dream and students who, who want to go on to have a university education or maybe, you know, are charting completely uncharted territory and are the first in their family or in their, their peer cohort. And this idea of, and I think it kind of comes back full circle to what Professor Cerf was speaking about, about this idea that asking for help and, and sort of, you know, seeking mentorship and seeking guidance and seeking advice is not a, a sign of weakness. If anything, it's the opposite. It's recognizing that you have something that you're trying to achieve and identifying people in your life um, who, who can help you, who can help guide you get there. And I think that that's, that's what's so, I mean, at least I think for us, that's what makes this topic so exciting is that mentorship is so multifaceted. It has so many different aspects. It's not a one-way street as, you know, as, as Professor Morbark was saying as well, it really is a, a, it's a relationship. And I think it's a really important and, and nuanced relationship. And I think it, it, um, it, it's something that deserves to be highlighted. So I guess with, with this, I'd like to, to move to, um, to Dr. Robertson and, and, and hear a little bit more about your experience with mentorship and mentoring others, working with, with university students um, and what the role of mentorship means for you today. Great, I think so many good things have been already said. And so in an effort to not be redundant, uh, I'm going to just kind of just kind of add a couple little flavors. So I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this recently and thinking about the difference between mentorship, which I'll define here as sort of advice giving um, versus sponsorship, which I really think of as <coughs> advocating for connections or grants or positions like for candidacy for things making those connections for people. Um, and I think this is, I'm not saying that one is more important than the other, and I, I, I certainly don't think that, but I think particularly for women and people of color, sponsorship is, is often lacking. Um, and for people that don't, you know, it's not just women and people of color, it's also people, you know, who maybe don't have a lot of sort of family connections or, you know, sort of wealth or sort of low resource environments, right? And low resource environments can be anywhere. I mean, they, 
anywhere worldwide. Um, and so I, I think this is extremely important. This is really, and a key thing here too, is that it doesn't again have to be hierarchical, but that it really can be peer to peer, right? So it's about, you know, identifying a characteristic or um, a skill set that a friend or, of yours has or a classmate of yours has and saying, hey, you know what? Um, I know someone else that has this job opening or this internship and I think you'd be really great or I really would just like you to meet this person and speak to this person because you guys have, you know, some really common interests and I think you guys could kind of, you know, hammer out these ideas together, whether it's a business idea or someone has sort of, you know, gone that path before. So I, I think this is really important. And the other thing I want to bring in here is this idea of holistic, um, really a holistic relationship as a mentor and mentoree. So not just taking sort of one aspect of the person. I think this happens a lot in the sciences where um, people can get kind of pigeonholed and it's sort of like, okay, well, this is your skill set. This is what your past has been with classes and with say research experience and where you want to go. But I don't really have to take into consideration who you are as a person or your family dynamics or your financial situation or, or anything else. And I think this is absolutely critical. I think as both mentors and mentorees, we, we really can't lose sight of these and, and you should never feel like you're being forced to do that in any of your mentor mentory relationships. I think as other people have said already, some of the best mentor mentory relationships I've had is for mentors that have really seen me as, as much of a holistic person as possible because they've been able to give me really targeted and personal advice that wasn't just like, oh yeah, like just do that. And it's like, well, what about all these other situations that are sort of in the way that I, that I need to be um, taking into mind and calculating. And then another key thing here is, you know, we're talking here about sort of key topic here is right is, um, is the environment, climate, sustainability. And I want to bring in this, this idea of a dynamic and yet also sustainable mentor mentory relationship. And I think, again, this harkens back to having a holistic perspective of your mentor and the mentoree. So one mentor, just like I would get, I guess I would say like, you know, one love is not necessarily going to fulfill every single aspects of your personality. Um, so really finding different mentors, whether that's hierarchical, different professors um, at different stages in your life, whether that's friends, whether that's family members, whether it's people that you meet randomly at conferences like this and keep in touch with, whether this is peer to peer, relationships ebb and flow like any other mentor mentoree relationships are no different. Um, but I think it's so critical to keep in touch and especially as a mentoree to update your mentors, to stay in touch, to, to let them know what you're doing, what you're excited about, what you've been up to, not just when you're quote unquote, like doing amazing work and you're getting recognized, but also in some of your down times when you want to kind of talk out ideas and, and um, sort of regroup and, and find like that reconnection with, with someone that saw something in you before. So I would just, and I, I think this is really big too, when we're thinking about COVID time and, you know, people are much more connected now in some ways. And um, one thing I would say would be, you know, if, you, if you're inspired by, you know, any one of us on this panel today, um, you know, drop us a note, find us on LinkedIn. Like I'll give, I'll pass on my contact. If, we, if you guys want to start a, a Slack um, platform discussion about mentor mentorees and share this, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to do this and, and help connect people. So, you know, it's, it's crazy times for all of us, but I think we can share learnings across industries and they're not all going to work for every single one of you. And I'm not going to be able to connect with every single one of you in the most meaningful way, but maybe I'll be able to provide one little pearl of, of um, experience or connect you with someone else that, that could be a great mentor for you. <laughs> Thanks. That that was that was that was great. Um, and I'd like to ask um, Dr. McCarthy Fakri about peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, and to tell us something about your experience with um, STEM sisters and and what um, what what's worked, uh, what you've learned from the experience that that could um, that could be helpful for the audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm very happy to share more about that. Um, 
uh, may I just give you a little personal um, input into what mentoring means to, to me first so that you know where I'm coming from um, and then I'll move on to STEM sisters. There's so many amazing things have been said already. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, for me, uh, mentoring is, is just can make such a difference in anybody's life. Um, it's the difference between just having a career or, or thriving in a career. Um, so I think that mentoring is a huge um, topic that we actually have the responsibility to put in place. I feel I am where I am um, by chance because I was lucky enough to be born with an older sister who did uh, a career in science also. Um, so she from an early age was like a mentor for me. But I, f I'm very, um, I feel very strongly that that. Um, where I am sh should be achievable through um, for everybody. It shouldn't be just by chance that you um, have a role model from an early age. Everyone should be able to benefit from um, what a mentor can um, introduce into their lives. So um, I also fully agree with the, the journey between a mentor and mentee being a joint journey. Um, I find people I have ended up mentoring um, have helped me so much in, in terms of how I look at things, how I, I, um, I need to dig deep to find the right advice for them, which changes my perspective on, on my, uh, my journey too. So it is uh, certainly a journey together. With respect to STEM Sisters Cambodia, so um, just to recap a tiny bit, we have a system where we've got professional women connected to university students, our big sisters, and they are connected to little sisters in high school. So um, our program um, is designed to, um, they are connected through Facebook Messenger. Facebook in Cambodia is uh, the main uh, communication method um, and, this was an important part of our program and we built it into the program that our, all our resources are available on Facebook and the communication is happening through Facebook. But what is important is that um, we run eight week programs and at the beginning of the program, we take a group of what we call our core participants and we put them through a leadership academy. The pro sisters and the big sisters are given mentoring training by specialists who, um, who are specializing in training Khmer women in Khmer um, with soft skills in mentoring and coaching. Um, and then also the, uh, all three tiers, pro sisters, big sisters and little sisters were also given leadership skills because the little sisters are tasked with um, launching a STEM club in their school using their leadership skills and with the support of the big and pro sisters. So um, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, it's, it's um, I would say our experience is the mentoring between big and little sisters. So it's slightly uh, just an older student to a younger student. And it was incredibly successful because um, each big sister uh, mentored four little sisters within a small Facebook messenger chat group um, and so even if they were geographically not in the same place, they first had the Leadership Academy physically all together, and then they split off, the little sisters went back to their school, and they were then mentored over an eight-week period by their big sister. And, and this relationship of big sister to little sister was really quite special. Even the word sister here, sister all over the world is a strong word, but um, sister in Cambodia can mean any female to any female. Um, can be your sister, I can see um, Mr. Sankham um, nodding there. So the word sister here was very important to us. And um, that sisterhood really was very, it came through very strong in our program. And um, even though it was a relatively short program, um, the, I believe after the program ended, the big sister to little sister connection still, um, uh, they, they stayed in contact. Um, and imp another important note is that midway through our program, they had a second face-to-face -face meeting. So um, I do believe, even though it's more difficult in COVID times, the beginning of the relationship would be wonderful to have a, a physical face-to-face -face 
meeting, especially when you're talking about young students. Um, but then to um, maintain that connection, that can happen virtually very easily through social media platforms. Um, but a little injection of a physical connection um, every now and then would also be of benefit. But I do believe um, a physical face-to-face -face meeting at the beginning mm -hmm. sets it up for success. Um, I'll also mention that we, we brought this program to Ratanakiri with a very remote area in Cambodia. And we brought that to um, Ratanakiri just at the very beginning of COVID. So we managed to do the face-to-face -face meeting just like literally two weeks before the school shut down. Um, but we had that meeting in place and our big sisters were able to travel back to Phnom Penh where they were from and they kept in touch with the little sisters in Ratanakiri, um, hundreds of miles away throughout the, the um, COVID pandemic sh school shutdown period. So that was really, um, uh, we were incredibly lucky to get that physical meeting in at the beginning. Um, but it, it really was um, a test of the program and, and I'm glad to say that it did persist, the connection did persist throughout the weeks. That, that's, that's really interesting. And that actually touched on what, what I wanted to ask about uh, the challenges for mentorship in the era of COVID and also specific to Cambodia, the, the, the particular challenges of, of remote um, locations and mm -hmm. Um, distances and it sounds like sounds like this has been a challenge um, in in your your mentorship program Una but it sounds like you absolutely found yes. ways of, of managing it we have because um, if you persist you will always find a solution um, yeah. so um, just to give a little bit more detail for that particular program that began just before the COVID pandemic hit we managed that first physical meeting but we weren't able to do the second physical meeting, which is normally midway through our program. So we adapted everything um, and created, a, we had thankfully some teachers in Metanakiri who were able to help us. And um, we managed to find a solution because the students were allowed to um, meet up in groups of 10 or less. So we split our whole participant group into groups of 10 and we um, had them separated into different rooms in a school. And we adapted all our um, learning resources into videos. We had major trouble with internet connection to communicate with them, but we basically throughout two days, we had um, a combination of Zoom, Telegram, Messenger, WhatsApp, and normal phone call. Um, and using five different um, methods, alternating between them when one would stop, we'd switch to another and we, we did it. And we pre-recorded videos were very powerful because the students, we could send them by file, they would watch them. And then we, it wasn't so reliant on the internet connection and we could have a quick chat about the video that they had just watched, but it was our big sisters in the video. So um, again, it was the same people that they were connected to in a pre-recorded video and then a quick chat that was um, not too reliant on internet connection to this rural area. Fascinating, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think it also sort of touches on, um, if it's all right with our panelists, I'd like to go to, because I know often in these, these sort of, um, these Zoom conferences, there are a million questions that come in at mm -hmm. the end and we don't really get a chance to, to take audience questions. So I think this, one of the questions that came in from Melvin Miranda in the Philippines, um, is that most of the time in work settings, the usual identified mentor-mentee relationships are more of the superior subordinate type of relationship. And do you agree that it can also be subordinate superior uh, relationship and, and subordinate superior mentoring? And I think this kind of touches on a little bit what's what's been discussed today is that mentorship takes a variety of forms um, and, and can sort of come from, from unexpected places. So I'm wondering if we can pose this question to our panelists about uh, perhaps a time when you've had a relationship with a mentee or where you found a mentor and something that has, has sort of come from perhaps maybe a bit more of an unexpected place um, and what this, this sort of two-way street of mentorship means to you. And I think if it's all right, we'll, we'll go back to the same order and start with Professor Cerf. 
Sure, I, I'll try to be quick because I know that there's so many of us and I'm afraid that they, so I, I would say that uh, we all have a mental model when we start kind of going into a relationship of how the relationship is going to look like. And it's true for mentors. I have one in mind, Yoda. That's the one I imagine. When I imagine a mentor, I imagine this little creature that tells you, give you the answer. But that's not uh, always how it looks. Like sometimes it's Yoda and he's just a creature that has been here for 900 years and just knows all the answers. But sometimes it's a person that's been there a week uh, before you, not an expert, but have got, has gone through the same kind of challenge that you're about to go to and can tell you. So I think this idea that it's always like the most senior person in the pyramid who is the mentor for the top, the tier below and so on, is could miss that uh, sometimes a mentor could be a peer who is not higher than you, but has experienced something. And I think that when we come to think of mentors, I think uh, it's critical to understand what they're mentoring us for. I think that uh, if you come and you know exactly, I need help in this thing, if you can even articulate it to them, then I think you you're, you create a relationship. And it's not unlikely that the person who is your mentor in situation one is going to be your mentee in situation two. So it's not that kind of it, it creates a hierarchy that it's a forever, that's the person who gives kind of like Yoda, but it's a relationship that, that could change a lot in the course of the journey that you work together. And I think that if you ask for personal ones, um, I had a, a PhD advisor, is a good example, who was by definition my mentor when I came, both for my academic life, but also for a lot of my personal life because we shared five years together at the PhD program where he was the responsible adult. But at the, at the course of those five years, uh, he realized that I'm much better than him in some things. In, in this case, he was a, a not great in communicating like in kind of a, a giving talks and so on. And, and I was trained for that for many years. And he came to me and he said, look, I'm your boss huh? on this thing. Give me your advice. And suddenly it changed the dynamics between us. And suddenly I was his, you know, Yoda uh, for certain things. And I think that, that to think of mentors as like a lifetime thing, and it's sometimes that is creating hierarchy could uh, uh, miss out something. And I think this is maybe something that is important for everyone to think about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Professor Moore Barak, I, I, I wanted to ask, following up a little bit, what uh, the idea of um, distance distance learning and and this is kind of a combination of two questions. This is both both following up on what, what we heard in the panel previously, and also a question that's come in from the audience about whether the question from the audience is, do you think that e-learning is just temporary or can it go on even after the COVID-19 pandemic is flattened? But that, that's a piece of the question, but what I'm also really interested in is whether, um, whether you think that with e-learning, distance learning and distance mentoring, is that helpful for, um, um, for, for, for more justice in, in learning, in, in more equality in mentorship relationships, or is that destructive? Mm, thank you. Uh, very interesting, but I'd like to take first the point uh, that was mentioned earlier. I read the very good uh, question on the chat. And I thought it raised a really important aspect of mentorship. So let me take that briefly and then I'll respond to your question. I'll be a little bit contrarian and I'll say that not every relationship from which you learn something is a mentorship relationship. So we can think of mentorship uh, maybe on some kind of a continuum that you can have more than one mentor, but not every relationship is a mentorship. And I think it needs several components to make it a real mentorship. And these components are, um, it needs to be someone that can enrich you and, and you can learn from. It needs to be someone who gets to know you as a whole person. And it needs to be someone who will be your cheerleader or your champion, someone who will uh, rejoice in your successes and, and um, 
give you energy to continue on your journey. So to me, mentorship is, is more holistic than any other relationships uh, that you learn from. And I would add, the question was, can a supervisee be a mentor of the supervisor? And I would say that, uh, first of all, I don't think that in an ideal world, a supervisor is a good mentor because that would mix the mentorship relationship with more administrative responsibility and supervision and will tie the uh, supervisee's hands in that they will not be able to open and share information and will be hindered in the learning experience from the mentor. So this is very briefly ab about that because I thought that the question was really excellent and, and very good um, in, in invoking some important elements. I would add one more thing to that. Um, we find in the mon modern workplace that um, some relationships, some supervisors are younger than the supervisee, especially in high-tech companies. And I did some consulting in a high-tech company. And because of the technical skills, they become sort of mentors to older people because they can guide, guide them in the process. And that process could be reversed at some, at some times when the supervisee has uh, different information. So all of that is pretty complicated. To your question about e-learning, um, in my school at the University of Southern California, we started with e-learning on a very special platform with Zoom and asynchronous material about, I would say, 10 years ago. So we were among the first. And because we sustained it for many years before COVID, my perspective on that is that it is here to stay. Uh, we have excellent experience, but you need to know how to do it well. It's not just putting material online and uh, having Zoom meetings. You have to plan it in a way that is different from a classroom experience. You can't just take your class uh, materials and put them online. Um, advantages of distance learning is that you can learn from other people. Look at us. We are uh, an example of how that process can happen. Uh, and to me, as a um, researcher of global relationships, it's wonderful and very enriching. At the same time, we need to keep in mind that we are social beings. Humans are social beings. We like to be in the physical presence of other people. And we need to find ways to augment that learning experience that is online with real uh, human contact. If you can't get it in the online experience and get it in other um other environments that will enrich you as a human being, create a learning group of people who live in your neighborhood. Um, when we can, after COVID, um, this would be really, really important to um, augment those relationships and uh, create them as more enriching for all of us as human beings. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I mean, I think the points that you bring up, both the fact that, you know, a, a mentor is somebody that you can, number one, learn from, number two, really gets to know you and invest the time in, in building this relationship. Um, and, and the third point is, it, you know, as a cheerleader and a champion for you, I think kind of is links to this question of what's the role of a mentor in times of COVID when, you know, when, when optimism is really hard, it's really hard to, to sort of encourage people. I think there's a lot of, you know, social and psychological and, and, and physical impediments in terms of connecting with people. And it makes it, you know, it adds an additional burden. And at the same time, really encouraging somebody to, to go into a field that might, you know, might, might, might be a bit scary for them, might be a bit more challenging. It seems like there's, you know, there's a there's a, a, a double dose of optimism and kind of cheerleading that's that's needed in the context of COVID. 
Um, so I, I guess I'm just wondering if we can put these, combine these two questions together and turn this to Dr. Robertson in terms of um, this idea of, of mentorship, whether it's from unexpected places and this kind of malleable nature of mentorship um, and not necessarily hierarchical one and how that kind of works, um, as well as the role of mentorship moving forward in a, in a COVID and hopefully soon post-COVID world. Yeah, I, I, I love what, what's been said already. I, I would say, I think it's going to be really important to share learnings across industries and kind of try them out, do some beta testing. What I mean by that is someone may, you know, give you an idea to, to do something or how to investigate a, a mentor or mentoree relationship. You try it out and it absolutely does not work. Um, but I think as was said earlier by Dr. Falkery, if you persist, then you know, you'll find a way sort of through it. So perhaps looking towards industries where people have been remote for a little bit longer and that being within the physical presence wasn't such a prescriptive requirement for that type of relationship, I think it's important. So looking to things like um, you know, more theoretical or computational roles or where things were more distance and you know, processing of data was often further from the source or things like you know, the tech industry in general where people are often behind screens and, and working at different hours and that sort of flexibility of, of lifestyle and work um, in terms of finding a mentor mentor relationship is, has already been practiced. So I related to that as well, I think is driving down into how do we identify a mentor? I think one good way to do this is to think about one thing that you want and not try to think of multiple things you want from one person, from one mentor, right? Um, it's almost like delivering a message on a PowerPoint slide, right? So, so have one message. We'll, we'll have one sort of ask and really make sure that you do your due diligence. And what I mean by that is researching that person, finding out what they've done, and really being able to take a step back and identify why that person could potentially be a good mentor for you or why you could be a good mentor um, for that person. And then as far as the reciprocity of the mentor and mentor, something that my PhD advisor always used to say, and I don't think I got it until many years later, I was a little slow on this one and probably many other things, um, but was the idea of like, okay, well, I brought you on, like I'm paying for this, but like also like, where's your excitement? Where's your energy, you know? And it was kind of, I kind of took it on like, oh, like I'm supposed to like also be this type of personality to sort of entertain you. But no, I, what I realized that that sentiment was this idea of, you know, youth and, and the mentory, the youth of the mentory, whether it's, you know, they're actually younger or not, just a, sort of youth of any of a sense. It's really the fresh ideas, it's the creativity, it's the excitement, it's the exuberance. And, and don't forget that the mentor, like they feed off of that. They're looking for that. That's what keeps them going. You inspire them with your discussions, with how you see things and, and how you sort of make those disparate and unique connections. Um, so really hearkening back to what was said earlier about this idea of, you know, sort of peer to peer or being able to sort of switch those roles or um, not feeling like you're in a subordinate position when you're asking for help. I mean, you're, you're bringing a lot to the table. Um, and so I think also identifying that, you know, what do you want from someone and, and what, what can you bring? And allowing that to be fluid. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Kuhn a question about mentorship um, that's, that's maybe not in a traditional sense that educators think of, um, of professionals within, within the community, but uh, how about members of the community who aren't formally part of a school district or part of the university? Is there a role for um, that could be non non traditional knowledge or um, or elders within the community. Yeah, that is a that is a really great you know, question. Um, well, uh, in the in in the in the school setting here, uh, pretty much you know all of the teacher pretty much you know the uh, 
you know, act as not only just the not just educator, but also the mentor as well. Whereas in the community, in particular, those who had achieved their, you know, profession, whether it's in engineering, whether it's in math and science or in technologies or in, you know, um, accounting or whatever the professions, uh, they, you know, are more or less, you know, are being asked to be a, a, a sort of role model, sort of uh, sort of advisor, you know, unofficially, like, you know, um, be a role model, be someone that, um, that can, you know, make themselves available for the younger generation, you know, to, to emulate, to want to be in our lives and so forth. Um, uh, you know, this is also, you know, happening in my own family as well. So later on, I had uh, learned that, you know, my younger brother, you know, um, got inspired by, by, by what I have done in terms of the academic achievement. And he wanted, you know, to, uh, it, it, it give him the, uh, the inspiration to wanted to, uh, you know, to achieve his education as well. Not in, not in the same, you know, field, but sort of, you know what, if my older brother can do it, this, I mean, with all of the um, barrier that he had, why not me? So that's the, like the dare, right? So in the same way, in the community too, you know, um, in the same way is that, um, so all these, you know, um, you know, uh, a role model more or less, um, you know, with a, uh, and now there's more and more, not only just within the, Educational contact, but also in this in the in the civic you know environment, you know uh, someone you know run for the city you know council and get elected, right? It gives the expression, you know what if Mister so and so can do that, is me so and so can do that, you know you know what I really want to do it as well. I can do better. I want to be I want to be someone you know like that or, or better than that. It give the hope. It give the inspiration. Someone who look familiar you know, to them. Someone who come from their background. Someone who who, may, who speak their language. Who understand you know, um, where they come from. It's really, really, it's really, um, you know, give them, give them that hope, give them understanding, give them, you know, extra aspiration, right? And then in the school setting itself, you know, uh, if, if the teacher from, let's say, you know, certain ethnic, you know, a group, a certain background, say, for example, uh, there's um, more uh, Cambodian American, uh, you know, teaching math, right? Uh, and of course, we hope that maybe the next generation there'll be more teaching liberal art and teaching history and so forth. But now, a majority of of, of um, a minority group, right, teaching math and science because those are the two subjects that that tend to be like you know popular within 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 the uh, within the immigrant in the community. So I have a lot of friends who are teaching you know math from from fifth grade all the way to all the way to high school, and of course you know to um, at our college as well teaching math. Um, so this, it gives, you know, um, the younger, you know, student about, hey, you know what, um, this is really, I mean, this, I can do that as well. You know, I have the aspiration to, to, to uh, you know, to, to be like that, you know, um, that if, you know, the opportunity, you know, to, um, I mean, like invitation, like an extra, extra encouragement, you know, it's, it's, it's not a direct mentorship, you know, but someone look it up to them, like, okay, you know what, is such and such, you know, can do it. So say, for example, now there's, um, you know, there's um, you know, there are two um, there's a there's a there's a woman who just got elected as a state representative, right? It represents my district, right? The 17th district, um, and this is the first in the in in the country, right? Here, I mean, here here in Lo, right? So it give you know um, that it give other young you know a lady, other young student, other young you know uh, immigrant or minority group, you know about you know what you know I want to be, I want to represent my community, I want to do something extra. You know, um, you know, for for my community as well. Um, in addition to that, you know, all of the um, let's say the 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 assistant teacher, right, teaching along with the mainstream teacher, also act as a mentor as well because they understand the language, they, they understand the culture of you know the community member. So being bilingual, being trilingual, being bi bicultural, you know, it's a, give them the ability to be more effective to act not only just as mentor. But also, you know, as as an extra, you know, role model to help, you know, um, you know, um, connected not only to the student but also to the <clears throat> to the parent, you know, as well, because the parent still have you know a challenge of the language barrier, the cultural barrier. So this is um this is a, a great way of of um of of this sort of um you know um official or non official kind of kind of you know mentorship or or, or role model, you know, you want to say that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And I think if if, um, if it's all right, if we can move on to, to ask Una, I think touching on this this role of, of culture and, and language um, and this notion of 
sort of non-traditional mentorship. And if it's all right, again, thank you so much to our audience for, for posing questions and please do keep them coming. I know we're, we're nearing towards the end of the, the panel. Um, but one of the questions was what, what should be the attributes of a mentor to sustain the responsibilities and supporting the mentee's success? So if it's possible to, to maybe combine these two and, and sort of touch on what, what are the attributes that really help uh, lead <coughs> to a long-term uh, mentorship relationship? And this, this question is for Dr. Fakhri. Apologies, I had a, an electricity cut. So, oh, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So I have not been here for the last few minutes, um, but oh, I think I, I, just, I just caught the end of that, that mess. That question was, what are the attributes, was it? Yes, yeah, I was just connecting it um, to what Mr. Kern was saying about the importance of culture, shared language, um, and, and these sort of common, common attributes, and, and mentorship is not necessarily taking the, the traditional role, and and beyond that, kind of expanding to what are the qualities that you think make for a good mentor uh, mentorship relationship, and what are the qualities that are particularly important for a, a long term sustaining relationship? Right. Well, that's actually um, a, a huge question. So I will try and summarize it. Um, so cultural sensitivity is is very important. Um, I think um, I, I want to emphasize that when we designed our program, we brought in um, some young uh, university students in here in Cambodia to help us. And some of them I would consider as my mentee now, and uh, I would be their mentor. Um, and their input was incredibly um, important to our program. And I think that they know that, and that has given them huge um, courage and a confidence in um, standing up to, to tasks that are, are requested of them. So um, they were very, um, because they were on board from the beginning, because obvi obviously I'm a foreigner here, because they were on board from the beginning, we designed the program with cultural awareness um, uh, built in. And we, I do feel it's very important in the context of Cambodia that the, um, role models and mentors that we're promoting are, um, are Cambodian and uh, Khmer speaking. And that needs to be inbuilt into every program um, because the Khmer language is at the point of needing protection, I feel, um, because um, most of the resources out there, especially in STEM, are in English. So we need to protect, protect the Khmer language, but also bring along English so that they can advance their knowledge. So um, I, f I feel like it seems like I'm going off off, t off the topic there, but I'm not because um, it's all intertwined with um, who your mentor is and who your mentee, uh, how best to serve the mentee. The uh, attributes that I feel are most important uh, uh, for, on the mentor uh, side are obviously the knowledge and experience in the field that the mentor is hoping to progress in, but more so than anything, it's um, the mindset of the mentor and whether they're open to having this journey together as a mentor mentee, where mm -hmm. I'm just checking, you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, they need to be ready and open to a journey together because I feel it's the um, back and forth interactions between the mentor and mentee that, that will set it up for success. So the mentor needs to be open to the fact that the mentee is going to change their own um, direction too. And mm -hmm. that should be the way. And so the attributes for the mentor should be, the mindset is, is, must be open. <coughs> They must have the right expertise uh, um, uh, to, um, in terms of knowledge, but it's not the most important. The mindset is more important and um, the time to commit and, um, and uh, the dedication that this is a kind of a, an agreement that, that you put some effort into. They need to be ready to put some effort in. Um, so I believe all those attributes are um, essential for a successful mentor-mentee uh, partnership. Partnership is important, partnership. 
rather than just um, uh, connection. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up a lot of really your question. Points. And I think that's, yeah, I think both uh, the idea of this being a partnership and the investment in time, um, as well as the idea of sort of communication both across, um, you know, across cultures and across potentially different fields is particularly important. Mm -hmm. And I think especially in, you know, in today's world where there are so many opportunities and, and fields are becoming more and more increasingly multidisciplinary and we're incorporating, which I think is a really positive, excellent thing, um, diverse perspectives. And at the same time, it really requ requires a kind of um, a particular, you know, sense of, of, of sensitivity um, and understanding and, and being able to, to really focus on, you know, what is it that I can give to somebody who might not necessarily see things the way that I do. Um, and I guess from there, I'd like to kind of move, move this question, present it to, uh, to Professor Cerf in terms of what, you know, what, what your view is working as, you know, a neuroscientist in the business school and how you view uh, this, this notion of mentorship and, and really bridging across different fields and, and what the challenges and, and some of the, um, the opportunities with that are. Oh, that's a lot. That's a big question. So uh, I'll do my best to answer it quick. I, I, I also try to read now a lot of the chat questions and kind of get a sense of what everyone saw. I'll try to compile everything in a really quick way. Uh, so, so indeed, neuroscience speak in my field of research looks a little bit like the alignment of brains. So how, what happens when I communicate with you right now? How, how do we kind of align our brain waves? And does it mean that you understand me? So without going into a uh, too technical uh, level, I would say that uh, there are some groups that tend to kind of see the world the same way and they actually align themselves and some that are not. And we can now easily characterize that. So using the tools of neuroscience, you can take two people, measure their brains while they look at a third thing. It's a content or, and it can just say, uh, me and Michal totally understood each other, but me and Miriam didn't understand each other. And here's what we need to do in order for Miriam to also be included. So we can now use tools for that. And those tools make it easier for people to kind of create this uh, uh, synchrony. But in a way, it's a, an excessive thing because somehow we, most of us intuit that. Like we kind of know when we see two people that, they work together and we know that it doesn't. So neuroscience is now catching up to the world of uh, empathy and uh, quantifying it, which is essential and it's useful. And for academics like ourselves, uh, it's really useful to be able to move from like, I felt good to, yeah, here are the mechanisms in the brain that show us that you felt good. So, so it's, it's very useful and companies are interested in that. And I think at some point it's gonna become part of everyone's reality. We're gonna have tools that will allow us to find perfect matches and say, this person should be your mentor. And it will allow us to also debunk a lot of like problems that we have right now. Like does the mentor need to be someone from your same gender, from the same age group, from the same race? Like we cannot have all kinds of myths that uh, we intuit, but now we can test them. So in that sense, I think neuroscience is opening this uh, path. It's not gonna be in any one uh, uh, future in the next couple of months. So those are people that are here and based on the question they ask, I don't think that I would recommend you guys to go to a neuroscientist and have him or her look at your brain and tell you who should be the uh, kind of perfect uh, person for you, especially since you're changing and evolving. So it will be very momentarily. And, and, and so it, it will be kind of a, a something you should know that exists and when it becomes a commodity you should definitely be part of it and i promise i'm going to do the best job to make it accessible to everyone as a neuroscientist if you ask me now to kind of refer to the question that you asked about like kind of what's what what are the traits of the mentors what are the traits of the mentees uh, what what I, i'm going to now lamp also the questions that i saw people asking kind of how to recognize that it works and so on i, I wrote while everyone spoke a, a list and it's by no means exhaustive and it's by no means something that I spent time thinking about, but I kind of wrote things that I wish someone told me uh, when I was in the uh, kind of audience. So, so here they are. I think that I, I definitely want people to think from, take from that, that there's roles that are on the mentors and roles that are on the mentees. And it's a job of both parties to make sure that the relationship works. So it's not like that you, you find one and say, you're my mentor right now and that's it. Impart on me knowledge or make me, you have to keep working. And it's kind of true for, I think, couples. 
It's not that you once you find your partner, that's it. Like you check, like now I have a husband or a wife, I'm good. It's a constant work. So in that sense, it's it's like every relationship. You have to keep working on it, even when you're inside. So here are kind of my top advice that I came. And really, this is not academic. This is just me intuiting things. But I saw that people ask. Sorry about that. So I think for mentors, I, I'm going to do it in one sentence each so, so I can move fast. For mentors, first thing, remember to ask the question, do you want my advice? I think some people as mentors think that, okay, if I'm the mentor right now, if I'm like, then, then, then that's it. Like I'm just now imparting knowledge and it's obvious that like everything I say is golden. I think that it's a good reminder for mentors to ask every now and then, do you want my advice? Or, or, or how do you want my advice? Like, to just kind of keep checking how to do it. One, two, I, say, I wrote, uh, it's really useful and that's true for a lot of to to not just say what not to do, but also what to, to do. Like not to say this is bad. This is not really mental shape. To say okay, here is how to do it better. Or here is how to. That is really useful too. I I wrote really quickly. I'm gonna really one sentence one each. Uh, I thought also another good for mentors. Let your mentees make mistakes. I think that the idea and that's I, I, I'm talking like a parent right now. Uh, the idea that the mentors uh, uh, kind of failed. If the mentee made a mistake, that's not true. Like the point is that you you want to make a mistake. You want to help them recover from the mistake faster. You want to help them recognize it's a mistake. But let someone make a mistake and kind of not just like cushion them and save them is really a, a, a useful one. Uh, I think that, that that's really my personal view, and I think maybe someone would argue. I think it's useful to be personal. I think it's useful to not see this as just kind of a, a mechanical relationship, but also to know the person you interact with outside of the context, if it's like a mentorship in the context of say academic, I think my advice would be ask the person also about their life, know who they are, break this uh, fourth wall that says like mentorship is only in one domain. I think like it's, if you have a holistic view of your mentee, I think you can uh, help them more. Here are uh, four uh, for the mentees and with that I'm gonna shut up and I think we'll be done uh, for the day. Uh, I think that uh, I think that uh, Lauren said it and I just echo that. I think it's really sort of more than one mentor. I think to think, okay, I found my mentor, then I'm done with this. Now let's find, I think for every domain, for every problem, for every challenge, for every incident, you have to have at least one mentor and you have many in your life, so you have multiple mentors and sometimes more than one mentor for the same uh, thing is really useful. Uh, also, I think that it's an important job for the mentee to not just take the knowledge of the mentor. It's like, okay, you're my mentor, teach me the five things, but learn how they think. To kind of look at the mentor and say, okay, how would they approach? Because they're not going to be there for every problem and every event in your life. So if you kind of learn, took from your mentor how they think about things, you will get more than just kind of the answer. Uh, third one, uh, I wrote and it came in the question, so I'm just answering that. The person doesn't have to be older than you. Like this notion of Yoda that I alluded earlier is really a kind of, it's just, we grew up on Yoda. So we think, okay, it must have pointy ears, small and really be good with the saber, lightsaber. They, can, they could be younger than you. I think that, that uh, Michal spoke about that when in the context of like a technic, technical skill. It's really like it, like age should not be the dominant factor in that. And, and I think that that's really critical. I think it's useful in an interaction between mentor and mentee to have an agenda that's on the mentee to come and say, here's what I need rather than just like impart knowledge on me. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a... Uh, uh, Two more things, but then I'm going to shut up. One is that uh, the job of the mentee is not to du duplicate the mentor. It's not like to say, okay, now that I, I see how they do, then I do the same thing. It's, it's to kind of take what they do and take a spin on that, which is bringing you. And the last one, and that's maybe the one that I think uh, is often overlooked, is remember that your mentors also have flaws and recognize the limitations. They, they, the fact that they're the, your mentors doesn't mean that they know everything on everything. They know on one thing enough to help you, but that's not kind of a reason for you to say, okay, like my mentor, I should dress like her and I should also uh, handle my relationship like her. They might be great in one thing and awful in others. And I think that it's useful to remember what they're good at. I think Yoda had a pretty terrible relationship with the, the English language. So uh, he didn't know how to speak well. He always reversed that. With that, I'm gonna shut up and let everyone else uh, chime in. <laughs> No, I think that was, I thank you. It was a, it was a real whirlwind of going through all the questions and, and really appreciate it. I think also the, the focus on, um, on, on things that maybe we might not necessarily have the tendency to emphasize, you know, the, the, the vulnerability of asking for help, the idea of learning from mistakes, the also, you know, the, the idea of recognizing when our mentors don't necessarily have the answer and, and learning from their limitations as well. And the sort of fundamental, you know, the, the, the recognizing, humanity and the mistakes that we're all kind of learning together and the fact that these relationships are not necessarily quite as hierarchical um, as as they might seem and I think 
Unfortunately, we're really running out of time, but I'd like to give the rest of our panelists uh, a minute to have closing remarks. So with that, maybe I'll go to Michal, see if you have, you have anything you want to add to this. I, I'll add a very personal note that uh, my dear cousin, Amir Axel, uh, that you mentioned, Miriam, your father and uh, Deborah's husband, um, was my mentor. And, uh, and so there's a intergenerational mentorship uh, happening uh, in this. So this special, this uh, session is, is very dear and special to me and I'm happy to be here and be able to experience it with all of you. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. To, to Lauren for any closing remarks. I will add, um, I had a very close mentor who just passed away um, about two months ago. And so I would just urge all of you, you know, this sense of sort of keeping that mentor alive. Um, someone made a joke of sort of like, you know, what would this person do? And, and sort of using that as a model to approach their own life, whether that's personal, professional, or, or for the further mentoring. Um, and the other thing I would say would just be, you know, to keep in touch with them, to keep them close um, and to cherish, you know, how, what they can offer throughout those different stages of, of life, whether it is personal or professional. And thanks, I just wanna thank the organizers and um, the ESL so much for, for this opportunity. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kuhn, for, for closing remarks. Certainly. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a pleasure and honor to be part of this um, first uh, international uh, conference on, on, <clears throat> and on STEMs. And I'm so honored that, um, you know, that uh, both uh, Deborah and, and Miriam have asked me to be part of this. And I'm looking forward to um, extend this, uh, this, this mentorship, right, this role model, not only just you know, among, you know, the population here in low, but, um, you know, uh, within, I think the next uh, few years. So I'm looking forward to, and particularly wanted to, you know, partner with, you know, uh, Dr. You know, Fakni, uh, you know, the, the idea of the, this virtual connectivity, right? The Mekong, Mary Mark River collaboration, right? Where we can do this exchange, you know, program. Uh, a high school student can, you know, go to Cambodia in the summer, you know, August and then in September and then, and go study there and then learn their Khmer language, their culture, but at the same time teaching English as well as other, you know, subject to the, you know, to, to the people, to, to the people in Cambodia. And of course, you know, um, get, you know, um, people from Cambodia to come and uh, continue their, um, their higher education here in, in America, whether it's at, you know, uh, University of Massachusetts Law or MIT's or, you know, Northeastern or Harvard's or, you know, um, you know, we have so great and so many great, you know, um, uh, colleges and, and, and university here. That idea of exchange, that idea of connectivity, uh, by virtue that, you know, our people, um, are, again, would, would benefit not only just, you know, within local, local area, but, you know, um, but, uh, but, but uh, across, across, across the, uh, across the continent. And this is something that um, I dream of, want to see that happen. Uh, you know, uh, uh, established in the future. And I'm looking forward to that kind of partnership, to that kind of, you know, relationship, you know, to, to, enable, to enable this 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 idea, you know, to become a reality in the near future. So I'm looking forward to that. So thank you for being, for allowing me to be part of this, this, uh, you know, this conference. Thank you. And Una, could we have a, a final closing remark from you? Of course, of course. And I welcome all those opportunities and, Thank you, Dr. Kuhn. Um, and it's really th this sort of event today is uh, demonstrates how connected we are and how it can lead to all sorts of opportunities. So, as I said before, mentoring for me um, has made an enormous difference in my life. Um, but I want that for everybody. It should not be um, a matter of luck that you were that you came across the right person to influence, influence your life. Everyone should have that person. So um, I'm hoping STEM sisters can play a part in that. And in 2021, we are just at the planning stages now, but I would like to add that we recently won an award called the Girls in STEM Award from Juniper Networks in, in the States who are a sponsor of the World Robot Olympiad. So our program coming in 2021 is a combination of promoting robotics to girls, mentoring mm -hmm. them, 
<clears throat> to enter the World Robot Olympiad and giving them the soft skills and technical skills to, for success. And I will also add that the theme of the World Robot Olympiad this year is clean energy. So it's a combination of mentoring, STEM and environmental education all wrapped up in one program. So we have our work cut out for us, but we are um, excited about it. So um, thank you to the organizers and to Miriam and, and Deborah for inviting me today and to the rest of the panel. It was an honor to meet you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I think it's been it's been great, and I wish I wish we had more time. I've, I'm seeing that in the the chat there is um, a new link to continue questions, and I think this would be. I mean, we're hoping to to use this as a jumping off point for questions and answers and conversations, and really seeing this as a as a conversation starter. So, as Lauren had said, please, you know, again, I mean, we, we please do reach out to us with with anything, uh, questions, ideas for for future future collaboration events, whatever it is. Um, and I think there's a really nice comment uh, at, at the end of the chat that mentoring is, is in this sort of holistic idea. It's fulfillment and it allows us to grow continuously both personally and professionally. And I think that really kind of encompasses um, the ideas that we've talked about today that it's, mentoring takes many forms. Um, there's a lot of work. It can be like a relationship where, you know, you really have to think about the sort of um, maintaining this this relationship and and you know helping people grow um, and I, I guess we just we, we really we appreciate all of you the audience members and our panelists and the organizers for for putting this together. Um, that's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Be thank safe you. and well. Be safe and well. Akunjang. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much for both question and answer and very, very interesting discussion on factual mentoring. I'm pretty sure that this panel discussion would be useful for our audience. So because of time constraint, we could not answer all questions have been dropped in the chat box. And the rest question would be answered in the forum. Thank you so much, our panelists, as well as moderator of the panel discussion. Now here's can the end of the panel discussion. So thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Yeah.